All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to uh, move this along so we get started. Members of some members of this meeting have to get to an 11 o'clock downtown, and so they'll have to leave right about 10:30. Uh, so our goal is to start uh, now and to wrap up at uh, at or just before 10:30. Thank you for coming. Good morning, I'm Jack Knowles, I'm the Supervisor in Sile. I just want to welcome everyone here. We're very pleased to uh, to host another stakeholders meeting. Uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, representatives from a lot of departments here today. I'm not going to try and uh, introduce everyone one by one, but I think we might want to go around the table and everyone just introduce themselves for the audience. And if there's anybody in the audience that uh, uh, is a, a representative of a, of a, like I see Jason over here from Washington County, after we go around the table, if you please stand up and, and introduce yourself. So let's start down here in this, on, on the end, sir. Jack. I'm Jackie, and I serve on the Ann Arbor City Council. Ann Bannister, Board 1, City Council. Kathy Griswold, Board 2, City Council. Dan Bicknell, Global Environmental Alliance. Laura Rubin, Chair of the Watershed Council. Roger Rail, Chair of CARD and Chair of SI Residence for Safe Water. Jack Knoll, SI. Mike Moran, Ann Arbor Township Supervisor. Debbie Dingell, 12 District Congressional. Michael Burkoff, EPA. Dan Hamill, uh, project manager for the Gelman site for Eagle. Uh, Jill Turner with Eagle. Christopher Taylor, Mayor of Ann Arbor. Jeff Irwin with the people of the 18th District. Kate Scott, Washtenaw County Board of Commissioners, District 9. Howard Lazarus, City Administrator, City of Ann Arbor. Gregory Dill, Washtenaw County Administrator. Kristen Schweighofer, the Environmental Health Director with the Washtenaw County Health Department. Jason Machieski, Washtenaw County Commissioner, District 1. Sue Shank, Washtenaw County Commissioner, District 2. That's Caruso, uh, board member of CART, and uh, her name is yeah, Street Watershed Group. Mitch Edelman with the field operations section of the Department of Energy, uh, Environment. <laughs> Eagle, Eagle. 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 Don't get used to that, sorry. Eagle, for sure. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, Kathy Knoll, Side Township Trustee. Jeff Ainer, Ann Arbor City Council. Jane Long, Ann Arbor City Council. Christine Green, Sio Township. Great, thank you. So we have a lot of ground to cover this morning in a relatively short period. Congressman, uh, Congresswoman Dingell is gonna begin the meeting and she, she will moderate the discussion. Um, Jack, thank you for that introduction uh, and thank you for hosting us today. Our pleasure. Uh, it's an honor to be here, and it's an honor to be here with uh, many people this morning. I also want to give a big thanks to Michael Burkhoff from EPA for traveling to be with us this morning for the work that he has done in the last year. And, you know, we've decided we've been having these stakeholder meetings once a quarter. Uh, I think this morning, I want to frame today's discussion because I think it's very important that we have a calm discussion today about where we are and where we want to go. And that this, Jason, you should sit at the table, Jason Morgan, Chair of the Wayne County uh, Commissioners. I mean, Washington County. Ah, it's been a long weekend. Thank you, Kathy. Um, uh, that we, we, there have been a lot of things said, a lot of questions, a lot of well, what does this really mean? Who's got what authority? What does? And I think a lot of people have spent a lot of time in the last few weeks trying to understand that. Uh, Michael, I'm going to ask EPA to give a presentation on where they're at, what they found, what they're going to do. I'm going to ask Eagle to give a presentation. Then I'm going to ask stakeholders to respond. I'm going to say several things as we frame this. You all have been at this for 40 years almost 40 years uh, and there are a lot of different parties to this there are a lot of different opinions but I can give some summaries that the people of Washtenaw County want to see this site cleaned up and the question is how are you going to get to getting that site cleaned up uh, I'm, I'm gonna let EPA and Eagle speak and then I may ask some further questions for clarity because I've heard lots of discussions and lots of, well, there's a court case, you can't do this. We've got some people who have requested a Superfund site, some people are part of the court and the consent decree, 
people like me and the other elected officials are not parties to that. We have to be careful to not talk about it. But we're also at a different time and place, and I think we need to find the common ground that's still going to take time, but it's going to be a plan that's going to get this site cleaned up. So I think I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to ask people that today is not a day. I've talked to all of the elected officials. We're not going to pontificate. We're not going to get up. We want to ask questions and understand where people are and what they're thinking. So with that, this is Michael's last meeting for the moment. He's taking a step back until certain things happen. I'm going to turn this over to Michael, and we'll go from there. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Dingle, and also thank you very much to all of you for uh, participating in this stakeholder meeting and all the meetings you've had uh, in the past uh, in your involvement on this site as a whole. Um, so a little over a year ago, um, as a part of the preliminary assessment um, and those activities, uh, that's a, one step in the process for the scoring for the scoring uh, process for a potential Superfund site. Um, EPA made a commitment for about a year of project manager involvement uh, for the purpose of trying to improve stakeholder relations with uh, the MBQ. Um, I'm not yet Eagle. having Eagle. <laughs> it's not rolling off my tongue yet, though it should. Um, uh, and some of it was in stakeholder meetings like this, uh, the uh, having quarterly reports instead of annual reports, which is the typical process when a state um, declines to give a concurrence letter in that listing process and decides instead to uh, continue to manage the site. Um, and to also look at the existing data and to evaluate whether or not there is a existing risk um, to human health where people are currently being exposed exposed sorry to uh, one for accident levels that pose a uh, unacceptable risk so EPA has fulfilled that commitment uh, we've uh, had a uh, we'll very shortly have the fourth of the uh, four uh, quarterly reports um, from Eagle and we've also looked at the existing data and come to the conclusion that based on those data um, that people are not currently being exposed to uh, one quarter dioxin at levels um, that pose an unacceptable risk. Uh, we've looked at the, you know, the groundwater um, in terms of whether or not people are drinking that groundwater. We've also looked at vapor intrusion, and people, people have also asked the question of whether or not there's uh, infiltration into basements. We've looked at that information too, um, and looked at you know, whether it's daylighting uh, in parts of the of Ann Arbor and potentially posing a risk there. So having um, come to the conclusion that in fact it, it, those are those one for doxing data do not indicate that um, there is currently a uh, exposure uh, at unacceptable risk. Um, so having done that, having fulfilled our commitment, um, and this is not a national priorities list, a site on the national priorities list. Um, we're going to be just directing our resources um, to sites on the national priorities list at this point in time. Thank you. So, well, let's do Eagle, and then I'm going to ask some questions. You go first. Uh, I'm Dan Hamill, the project day-to-day -day project manager for Eagle for the Gilman site. And what I have, as far as my update, I have a uh, can let you know what has been going on. Uh, uh, Michael identified a. a four progress reports I have uh, am finishing up the fourth one it will be out this week uh, I just received the last internal comments it is um, again uh, uh, the fourth of the uh, uh, committed uh, four reports uh, it will have a monitoring well trend analysis uh, it is uh, we asked Gelman to uh, provide that to us for us to review they provided that, and I just incorporated, I only got it at the end of April, just incorporated into the uh, quarterly report. The EQ Eagle will be uh, uh, looking at that and uh, making comments, but it will be available in that report uh, this week for, for stakeholders to take a look at, too. Uh, the other activities that we've been doing, uh, we're ongoing Allen Creek drain sampling. We've, uh, we have, uh, have sampled uh, April 18th. We'll be sampling at strategic locations. 
that were decided upon by Washtenaw County and, and Eagle uh, through July. And then uh, a, a report will be, a summary report will be submitted for two stakeholders to uh, at, in September. Uh, we are also in the process, have started the process of the NPDES permit renewal. Uh, that was, uh, the application was submitted in March, middle of March by Gelman. Uh, they had to submit it by April 4th, I believe, uh, under the old permit. It is in our water resources uh, group, uh, started that evaluation. And uh, it, uh, the, this current permit uh, is, is done, expires October 1st. So they will be working on that uh, coming up. And just to let you know, water resources uh, representatives will, I've invited them and they will be attending. Uh, last they told me, I will check today, they will be attending tomorrow's card meeting to review the NPDES uh, process and where they are in that process. Uh, we've also initiated with Washtenaw County uh, the sampling, 2019 sampling, uh, of the uh, water supply wells that we uh, do yearly. Uh, this year there's uh, 117 uh, uh, residential wells and business wells uh, that will be sampled between now and, and uh, the end of August, I believe, is the last sampling sampling event for, and then uh, information will be before the end of the fiscal year. This year we added uh, some additional sampling, not for just one four dioxate, but at the request of stakeholders, we've added uh, strategic and selected locations, we've added the uh, VOC, other VOC analysis, and uh, volatile organic contaminant analysis, and semi-volatile organic contaminant analysis, uh, based upon stakeholders requests and history of information about the Gilman site. Uh, that's, uh, that's what we have currently, that is, that is outlined in, like I said, the quarterly report, and that will be coming out this week. Thanks, Dan. Uh, again, my name is uh, Gerald Tiernan. I am the district supervisor for the Jackson District for Eagle. Um, many of you know me from here and also for our PFAS response as well. Um, so, uh, so also on, as part of the update, as we talk about, um, you know, this final quarterly report for, for EPA's purpose, so to speak, you know, we have committed that we're going to continue this quarterly report um, it, I, we're going to change the format a little bit, uh, but we're going to continue to do quarterly reports moving forward. Um, um, they're not going to be necessarily directed right to EPA. They're just going to be directed generically to the stakeholders as far as updates and continuing uh, more of the public engagement. I know one of the goals of EPA's involvement um, at this point has been to increase the stakeholder involvement. And I think we've done that, and I hope to keep uh, keep that going. We continue to do card meetings. We're going to continue this quarterly reporting, um, and, and I would assume we're going to continue some of these style of meetings too, um, not just with card, but generic stakeholder meetings. Um, as we know, uh, some of the summary is you know we, we have a current consent judgment on the site that dictates how the site is 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 moving through the process. Um, you know there. There's no current unacceptable exposures. Uh, and, you know, we continue to negotiate with Gelman and um, the various interveners towards a modified consent judgment that takes into account the 7.2 cleanup criteria. And uh, we continue to do that. And while we can't uh, be very specific about some of the parts of that, um, they do continue to happen and, and are currently still uh, ongoing. And with that, I, I think we have... You know. I'm going to ask some questions yep. for clarification. Sure. Just sure. So in discussions with many of the people in this room and many of the communities, there are um, a number of issues that come up that people have questions on. One is state law versus federal law. And what Eagle is working towards, and what if this were so? Uh, to be clear, I'm gonna. It's an undercurrent. The EPA cannot stay involved at this point. I want to make sure I'm saying this right. Unless the governor requests that EPA stay involved, by such that two of the communities have asked that this be designated a Superfund site. When uh, you are 
with EPA studies you for placement and the national priorities list, the state of Michigan must ask for EPA to do that. In the previous administration, that the state did not want well. We, uh, I'm going to say one other thing for the record, which is uh, we have a new attorney general, a new governor, and I'm your old member. Uh, but it is very important to me that I be on the same page as the attorney. I've said this to Dana. I've said this to the governor that we, uh, uh, Yusuf, you should come to the table. Yusuf Robbie's just joined us. Um, that I be on the same page with all of them. And everybody is trying to study this and understand what it means. So now we are at a point on that. So then we all want to understand, okay, what's state law and what's EGLE working towards and what is federal law and should the governor request that EPA, and let's be clear that the governor asking EPA to become involved would still have a timeline, no guarantee that EPA can't do that. They've got, done the work that they can do until that happens. So could both of you comment about what EPA's goal is, what EGLE's goal is? Yeah. Um, so at groundwater sites where you have, um, where it's a drinking water aquifer, um, the National Contingency Plan, which uh, tells us how to implement um, the Superfund laws, uh, sets a number of expectations. Um, the expectations are that if it's a drinking water aquifer, that that aquifer be restored to beneficial use. Um, it also expects institutional controls are not a, um, uh, the, the remedy, um, as it were, um, they can be used as a part of a remedy, um, and that um, it says that um, in phase it sets the, the expectations for restoration of an aquifer to beneficial use. Uh, there's a Osborne director that's a uh, Office of Solid Waste and Environmental Response uh, or Emergency Response. Uh, uh, directly that uh, outlines it more clearly. I'd be happy to share it with people afterward. Um, but that's basically what it sets out. Question: What yeah. does it set out for aquifers that are not drinking water aquifers? Well, it says um, uh, it may be slightly different. It may be that there would be a, a containment of uh, contamination within that aquifer. Um, and it's not necessarily whether or not it's being used right now. It's whether it could be used as a uh, um, drinking water aquifer. So the answer that you just offered, you think, would apply to the aquifers we're talking about in this particular cleanup, or or, or would it not? It would be, I, I think that this aquifer would be a class one aquifer, which is what we uh, call a drinking water aquifer. Okay. Thank you, that's, that's okay. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that, I'm trying to get him to talk English. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah. So this, yeah, so, this, yeah. so it's a, uh, at a class one aquifer such as this, uh, and that's a, 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 love. a determination that the state actually makes and tells us. Um, whether or not this is a uh, class one aquifer, um, that's the uh, guiding expectation. If it's not um, practical or is, uh, to be able to uh, restore it to beneficial use and other uh, alternatives are then entertained. Eagle. Uh, yeah. I was going to invite uh, Mitch Edelman to speak more about you know the goals of Eagle. As, you know, Mitch has been around. I know most of you have known him for years and years. He does a much better job than I can of, of summarizing the, the things that we've been, where we've been, and where we're going. And can we talk okay. in English to the extent possible? We you can. And you've got Mitch, Mitch is great at that, and I'm gonna let him talk. Mitch, you want to? Yeah, I hate to put you on. A, do you want to come up here? And, <laughs> I, I don't know who we're addressing if I you stand will, back there. I will speak loudly enough. Let me know if you can't hear me. So Eagles' goals for this project, in brief, are to assure protection of public health, safety, welfare, and the environment. We have got a mutual objective with many of the stakeholders in this room, including the municipalities. We've heard for years and share the objective of making sure that Barton Pond, which serves as the 85% uh, of the drinking water for the city of Ann Arbor and the townships and other local governments that it supplies, we want to make sure that that's protected as well as the private wells are using our state generic drinking water criterion, which everybody in this room, I think, is aware, recently got revised downward, I should say, from 2017 officially got revised downward from 85 parts per billion 
to 7.2. And um, as we've talked about with the community, we're working, negotiating with the liable party, as well as the intervening parties, as Jerry said, to embody the remedy of the legally enforceable agreement to use that lower number of 7.2. We are also working to address other concerns that we've heard from stakeholders and share uh, that we're not at liberty to discuss because of the confidentiality of the negotiations. However, we, you know, by virtue of our involvement in the community for years, we understand and share um, the importance of being able to monitor receptors, that includes private wells at businesses and residences, as well as assure uh, the, the conclusions of both the liable party and the city's consultants that the plume isn't likely to migrate to Barton Pond. And so it's important that we monitor and determine whether that's happening or not. As it relates to listing on the national priorities list or the Superfund list, Michigan's been, you know, Superfund got passed in 1980 and Michigan's been heavily involved ever since then with um, at one time over 80 Superfund sites in Michigan. I personally uh, started my career as a Superfund project manager and then uh, before I transferred to Jackson was a Superfund uh, unit chief supervising many sites in Michigan. So we're very familiar with the process and our position right now, as a, and, and keep in mind we haven't yet had a chance to yeah, we brief. We do share our same now. Excuse me? Don't we? Yes, right. We haven't yet had a chance to brief our new director and new governor and Congresswoman, you're absolutely right that um, a governor uh, can and uh, is required under the National Contingency Plan to make a recommendation on whether they support listing on the Superfund. Given our experience with the Superfund process, uh, keep in mind and, and, and keep in mind that EPA Region 5 folks have come to, for example, the City of Ann Arbor's Environmental Commission meeting in uh, January 2017 and said in public that EPA is not sure whether the site's even eligible. By ver they view the pro Superfund program as a program of last resort so that when um, a state and a liable party are working on a remedy, EPA is hesitant to get involved. And then when you add the fact that we've got a state consent judgment in place, uh, Superfund is not even sure whether it's eligible. We all agree that the, the extent and nature of the contamination at Gelman makes it an NPL caliber site. When it comes down to whether and how a remedy under Superfund would look different under Superfund than it looks under our current approach or possibly a revised approach under the hopefully uh, modified agreement that everyone mutually agrees to, including interveners, Gelman and the state, whether uh, that remedy would look different than a remedy that we're likely to get out of Superfund is very questionable in our estimation. We think, as Jerry said, the risks are currently reliably managed in the sense that people are not drinking 1,4-dioxane contaminated water in excess of state criteria. We've heard in the community people say EPA's got stricter criteria. The fact is, EPA has no 1,4-dioxane criteria. EPA, in their Superfund select, remedy selection process, does a site-specific risk assessment, and then they use uh, the, something called, and I'm trying to, I'll, I'll try and use uh, plain language, but there's something called applicable or relevant and appropriate requirements that are required as a threshold criteria for EPA remedy selection. The short term, shorthand for that is ARARS, but again, this stands for applicable or relevant and appropriate requirements. So where the state, in our case, has a 7.2 part per billion generic cleanup criterion, EPA has accepted that. They've accepted 85 in Michigan when we had it. EPA uses a range for Superfund sites of one in 10,000 to one in a million cancer carcinogenic risk. Our 7.2 criterion falls approximately right in the middle of that. So yeah, at one in 100,000 for EPA, it would be 3.5 parts per billion hours and 7.2. The more conservative end of the EPA's risk range, it would be 0 0.35 parts per billion. The more, uh, the, the one in 10,000 end of the range would be about 35 parts per billion. So 
in our experience working on Superfund sites, uh, even if this were to get listed, if the governor were to support listing Congresswoman. There's no guarantee that it would be listed, but it begins a process that is going to take a couple of years to even study. The many years to list, many years to further investigate, including a site-specific risk assessment, EPA and their remedy selection process, and Michael, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but in EPA selection process, they look at two threshold criteria. One, uh, they start with a baseline of no, no action. What happens under the no action alternative? And I, I, I wonder whether EPA would look at no action as the current pumping of 500 gallons per minute uh, that Yellman's currently doing, along with the monitoring that we've got in. I think consistent with other Superfund sites in Michigan, EPA sort of used that as a basis when, when the state's been working with others. So I suspect, but Michael can speak to this uh, perhaps better, uh, you know, so the no action might be the current, the status quo, and um, would there be unaccept unacceptable risks with that, and um, how much time it would take then to come to a decision using the two threshold criteria of is it protective, and does it comply with applicable or relevant and appropriate requirements, and then there's seven other balancing criteria. Okay, can we go to English again? Okay, sure. So, um, but am I, I've had a lot of conversations, I know a lot of people here are. The state's goal is containment, EPA's would be cleanup. Is that too simple? The, the state's goal is to make sure nobody's uh, unacceptable. But you don't exposed. want to clean up the whole site. What, we, you, you, it's not state law. <laughs> So, uh, we... The answer is yes. Yeah. I, 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 I don't want to say, I don't say about in terms of warranty, because I think that there's a, there's a, okay. uh, a long um, record, uh, you know, documented record of what the uh, state has sought. Uh, and over the years, they have sought very aggressive cleanups of the remedy. Uh, um, very aggressive claims to the remedy. Um, the expectation with uh, for EPA's groundwater um, cleanups is that, to the extent practicable, um, that we seek to try and uh, achieve that number, that 7.2, which uh, so Mitch was talking about a number of cleanup numbers, um, and he's absolutely right that EPA does not have its own cleanup number in a situation like this. Um, EPA then looks at the state numbers. That state number is well within the risk range. Um, it's you know significantly lower than 35. It's you know above 0.35, so that we would be looking at that as a uh, cleanup number, uh, taking our guidance from the state. Um, the question I think then becomes, where is that number applied? Um, the expectation, to the extent, to the extent we can, and that's an evaluation that EPA has not yet done, is that that 7.2 is uh, applied throughout the plume. Um, not uh, at a certain boundary, and if it's at a boundary of the plume, that might be at the uh, you know, border of the facility. Um, so it's, I think that's really you know, one of the fundamental differences. And no, we would not look at um, the current situation as the uh, no action alternative. The no action alternative would be truly no action. Um, if nothing was done, um, that'd be, but I think that really gets into a remedy selection process that we're really not, you know, that's. We're not there. We don't have a letter from the governor, um, and it's not uh, at this point in time. It's not head towards national priorities list. So let me ask a couple of other questions because these are issues I hear from different people. So people like me are not party to the court, so we don't know what's happening. But some people have said because there is a court case, there is a consent. People trying to that it would be too confusing, and e EPA would be working on opposite ends. Is I, I believe that that's actually not, or could you both, could you comment on that, Michael? I, I am, so opposite ends, uh, because there's a, a, concern, a consent judgment right now. Right, about whether you would be working, I think you said counsel said you could come right in on top of the court case. I wouldn't, I don't want to get too specific in that, just other than that, you know, um, you know, the existence of a consent judgment wouldn't stop EPA you after. Like, please? Okay, uh, I'm not going to get too specific in exactly what that, um, how that would look, because that's all very speculative at this point in time. Um, but EPA would not be uh, stopped from taking action because of the consent judgment. Is it 
Yeah. I have a question for, for you, Michael, which is um, you've said a couple times now that uh, our goal would be to clean the site up as much as practical. <coughs> Can you talk a little more about what practicable means? What are the boundaries of that? How do you determine it? Um, you know, uh, is that all about just the physical practicalities or are economic practicalities relevant to your determination as well? Um, there's a number of factors that go into it, but that's something that would uh, be evaluated during a real investigation, um, which is th that document the EPA uh, uh, generates. Um, it's an activity of simply a summary of the activity of evaluating the contamination, the nature of the contamination, the extent of it, um, and actually into the feasibility side where you look at the technologies that you could potentially apply to um, of clean, uh, the contamination, whether or not it would be an effective means of cleanup. So it would be something that we'd be doing during that part of the process. Um, and there'd be a number of factors, economic and um, uh, you know, physically if it's possible to, to do that kind of a, a treatment for uh, the contamination and that's something that's an evaluation we have not yet done and so you do weigh just to be specific you do weigh the cost that the responsible party will incur as a result of engaging in responsive activities against the public health benefit of removing the pollution and if the cost is very very high and the benefit is very very low does does this federal law require you to consider that or allow you to consider that or are the economic impacts on the polluter not a part of the consideration. Whether or not there's a polluter or not a polluter isn't a part of our consideration. So we look at, so I, as much as, uh, you know, the balance that you're describing is whether or not the cost of the polluter versus the, uh, you know, benefit of cleaning up. No, that's not how we uh, frame that question. You know, we evaluate all of our remedies whether or not there is a polluter or not uh, the same way. Um, that's something where we have a, a lot of backstops uh, built into our, um, cleanup program to make sure that we're treating all sites equally uh, and not either um, being, you know, going for the, uh, you know, Cadillac remedy when there's a polluter or going for the, you know, cheaper remedy when there's not or the other way around. Um, that's not a factor in terms of our evaluation. No, we look at uh, whether or not, you know, you know, bang for your buck, can you get the stuff out of there um, in a way that's uh, effective um, and that's actually, you know, it can make a difference in terms of reducing contaminant levels. Um, so given the fact that a minute ago you said you evaluated the site, we've determined that there is not an unacceptable risk. How does that play into the analysis you were just talking about? In terms of going for a Cadillac cleanup or you know, maybe what we've got now? What I value is just a current snapshot. Um, just in terms of what are there actually people um, drinking or consuming or, or coming in contact with uh, contamination that poses an unacceptable risk if it's above um, the current criteria. Um, that's not exactly the same as evaluating whether or not um, you know, further cleanup is required. And that's not something we've done, so any kind of you know, um, further statements about you know, what we would be looking at is uh, you know, speculative other than to say these are the guiding principles, um, the expectations set by the, uh, the National Contingency Plan. I'd like to uh, follow up a little bit on the uh, on the Superfund analysis and the court case. Yeah. Uh, so what I uh, just to be sure that I understand what I hear you saying is that the Superfund application, uh, the Superfund evaluation, and the Superfund remedy uh, are, from EPA's perspective, analytically distinct and separate from the, the existence and the, you know, the, the existence of the current and the negotiation of a potential uh, future consent judgment on the state side. That is to say they are independent and parallel processes from, from EPA's perspective. Is that accurate? You know, um, I, I think, yes, yeah, so if you're asking basically, are these two, two separate things that they don't impact each other? They're separate, from, from EPA's perspective, they are separate tracks. Yeah, I think that's a fair statement. Does the existence of a consent judgment or the uh, the terms of the consent judgment impact the remedy that EPA would ultimately, uh, if uh, if application were made, if application were granted, uh, if does the existence of an uh, of an ongoing consent judgment uh, action uh, impact what EPA's ultimate remedy would be? You know, at this point in time, that's speculative because we're not you know even uh, evaluating that. It's 
point in time. So structurally, no, although substantively, it might. You know, EPA's revenue selection is driven by its evaluation of the risk um, through the remedial investigation feasibility study and looking at what alternatives could then uh, address those risks. So the, the, the fact of the state remedy does not, uh, does, does not alter their evaluation. EPA has its own criteria. It evaluates those criteria based upon uh, the site and safety rather than what the state or cities or uh, polluter are doing with, on the state law side. You know, um, what I want to get away from is this notion that um, there would be two tracks ongoing at the same time. Um, you know, we work cooperatively with our state counterparts, um, and I think that if there were to ever be a letter of concurrence, it would mean that the, uh, they'd be working hand in hand with our state counterparts on whatever moves forward beyond that. Could you, could you comment on state law versus federal law and what tools are in the toolbox that EPA has? For instance, you, if the site were to be found, you have tools in your toolbox that would allow you to go after the polluter that the state does not have, if I'm correct. Um, we have very strong enforcement tools. I don't, I'm not as familiar with the enforcement tools that the state has uh, on sites that are not on the national priorities list. Um, so I'm not entirely comfortable talking about their enforcement tools, but we have a number of enforcement tools where we can compel work if we need be. So, um, I wonder, has anything changed, Michael, from when Joan Tanaka has said in public, in a couple forums, that even if the governor were to recommend listing on the MPL, the existence of the state consent judgment renders uh, EPA to question whether the site is even eligible for listing on the MPL. Joan has said that in public a couple times, both in the meeting with the, the County Health Official and Water Resources Commission in July of 2016, as well as in January of 2017 to the Environmental Commission. So I, I, we heard pretty loud and clear that, they view, that EPA views Superfund as a program of last resort. So I, I, that's one thing, and then another, I can speak a little bit, Congresswoman, to the difference in state law. The big difference between uh, federal Superfund and Michigan environmental remediation law relates to the liability standard. EPA has what's called a strict joint and several liability standard, whereas Michigan has something called a causational liability standard. In the case of Gelman, where we've already got through the courts and litigation, the determination that Gelman is liable, the, that question is moot. So then the question becomes... But I don't know that that's as moot as you think it is, because there are... Here's what I'm hearing. I'm trying to represent the people that are here. And as are we. Yes. And have an English conversation. Okay. <laughs> Not your... And that is that EPA, that... Gelman is not in court at the moment. Plus, you know, we're all here in speculation. I'm not, a, I'm not, a, I have no idea what's happening in the court. But that it's been almost 40 years and this site is still not being cleaned up. And that there are a lot of people that live in these areas that want to see the site cleaned up and how do they get there? There's a question over here. If EPA were to take over, if there's the letter of concurrence and the EPA takes over, is it possible that less, and I don't know exactly what no action means in terms of whether less would be happening than is, but if EPA takes over, is it possible that less would be happening than is happening now to contain it? I can't answer that question because you know, we have not done any kind of evaluation as to what the appropriate remedy would be here. Kathy had a question. Yes, I, I was thrilled that this meeting was going to happen. I was honored to be here. As an elected official, I thought we were coming here to work towards a solution for our constituents. And I can tell you, wherever I go, people approach me, and the first thing they say, fix the roads. The second thing they say is, should I buy bottled water? I'm afraid. And so we can talk about unacceptable risk. 
and what's mm -hmm. practical, but I can tell you there's tremendous fear in our community. And what I believe we need to do is what's called a full court press. We need to be looking at every option that's available <coughs> and aggressively evaluating those. That's what my constituents want us to do. So I hope, I hate to raise my voice, but I really hope that we can deliver a solution which will be safe water so our constituents are not fearful. Thank you. I don't know which one to do, so. I guess it wasn't. Uh, so, Mr. Burkhoff, you said that the EPA wouldn't be stopped from taking action because of the consent, existence of the consent judgment. Um, in a similar vein, would uh, local municipalities or a group of intervening parties or the county be stopped from acting if we felt, uh, if we had a national priorities listing? or we felt that uh, it was taking too long and we want to act on our own, would, would that interfere with the, if the EPA was on the site, could we act on our own? I mean, we could act on our own now, even with the consent judgment in place if we chose to. We want to float an environmental bond and clean it up ourselves, pull it back. Um, would, would, what would be the situation with the EPA? Would we just completely cede control to the EPA's oversight of, of this problem or would we be able to act also? I'm not familiar with some of those local local laws, so I don't know if I can answer that question. Okay. Um, but it is more than one community that's impacted. So yes. what we got to do is bring all the parties together and get yes. them on the same page. Thank you. Can I just ask a follow up to that? What, what's the process of disengaging the EPA? Once the EPA is, is, say you were to become engaged in this project and somehow it lessened the cleanup and we as a community were like, actually, we don't want the EPA. How do we, what's the process of that? Is there a process? Um, not one that would be uh, happening uh, in the uh, immediate sense, no. You know, once the site's on the national priorities list, um, it is, it's a super fun site. Um, we, uh, we working with our state counterparts, um, you know, develop, evac, uh, develop uh, potential remedies, uh, select one, move forward with a cleanup, and then eventually move towards uh, de uh, delisting and deletion. Um, and so maybe it very maybe a years out, yeah. After there's a cleanup that's been implemented. But the cleanup complete. plan would be a plan to clean up the site. Yeah, it would be. It would be by this point in time to say what that would entail is speculative because we haven't done that work right here. And what um, what opportunities does, does the community have to participate and provide feedback and input into the remedy selection process? <coughs> Um, you know, certainly in terms of uh, providing feedback and uh, involvement, um, you know, much like here, uh, throughout that process of, uh, you know, it's through stakeholder engagement. Um, during the remedy selection process, um, you know, after proposing a remedy, what's called proposed plan, um, EPA then does evaluate stakeholder um, uh, input as a part of that, um, the uh, nine criteria. And I, I'm going to, unfortunately, getting more experience at this that I want. I've just gone through the McLeod process, which is why I'm able to crystallize better now where we are. And they've been very engaged. They've done community leader meetings. We just did a tour last week with all the local leaders. And there's a, they're very engaged. And it's not yet been, it will be listed. I guess I'm not supposed to say. So, Brian, don't write this in the next two weeks. But everybody knows that it's, it, it's coming. It's already on the website. Is it? Well, they put the note, but it's not a fit. They've been telling me for two months it's going to be official. So I would like it's to challenge official. the notion that it's uh, TQ or Eagle is being protective of Ann Arbor <coughs> and Sion and Ann Arbor Township. Um, when we started this process, there was no plan by the DQ to look at near surface uh, groundwater exposures. Um, we have since found that. Uh, because CARD has pressured the DEQ <coughs> to do these tests um, and we you know, worked with them for a long time and decided okay we'll do some simple tests and lo and behold they found on the west side of Ann Arbor we're having uh, 19 part per billion near the surface. Um, we have near my house 85 part per billion at a shallow well. Down the street from this house uh, there was a foundation dug, and it immediately filled up with water, indicating very high groundwater. 
um, in our neighborhood, all through the, the west side. <clears throat> Three, 11 blocks up from that, base, from that basement, we have over a thousand park per billion moving towards the downtown. Um, you know, we need to make sure that we're being protective. When DQ had a town hall meeting, the deputy director, Bob Wagner, made the point that Barton Pond is not at risk because Barton Pond <coughs> has a natural protective uh, element related to it. He says that there's a blocking agent at Barton Pond. There's so much water pressure that the dioxin would never get into Barton. So we had a PhD geologist work with us for a number of years. He's now the chair at Central Michigan University, still working on this plume. A week later, we had a card meeting. And I asked him, I said, what do you think about Bob Wagner's point that Barton has a natural blocking agent? He immediately said, no, that's not true. In fact, there's a downhill run into Barton once it passes M14. There's a preferred flow of groundwater down an old creek bed, ancient creek bed, right into Barton. He said, there may be some slight blocking agent at the dam, but the rest of the pond is not protected. Um, so, you know, we do have situations here where we don't find that we're being protected. Um, so I have a, a report here from a card member who's got a PhD in inorganic chemistry. He worked at Dow Chemical. He did fate and transport of chemicals as a job. He was a consultant <coughs> after he left, uh, retired from Dow Chemical. He was, he's in Sunward Housing, which has, a, which has a monitoring well on its site. So he was very interested in this, and he wrote up a report. And he feels that the near-surface groundwater vapor intrusion issue that uh, wasn't even on the radar until CARD pressured the DEQ to include that in their evaluation. His analysis is 100 part per billion, not 1,900 that the DEQ is presenting. So I'd like to hand this to Mr. Bergkopf, and I'll send you an electronic version. <coughs> But I think, you know, we have issues where we need to make sure that um, the community is not at risk. And I think with all the wet basements on the west side, um, I think we have a real vapor intrusion issue um, that uh, is threatening the community and is not being seriously taken. The DEQ is not doing significant, uh, I would say, you know, uh, logical tests for vapor intrusion and groundwater near ground, near surface groundwater exposure, they're you know doing really simple. You know we'll test the creeks, and they didn't think they'd find anything, but they did. And we need to move on. We need to make sure we're doing. And CARD has asked for that, and it hasn't happened. So whether DEQ is being protected or not, I think is an open question. And I think we are uh, Ann Arbor residents and Silo Township and Arbor Township residents want to make sure that. Uh, we're not being exposed to this compound. Um, it's a very dangerous compound. My wife's a toxicologist at the university. She wanted to be here today, but she had a meeting. She had to go. This chemical is not something that we can just ignore and hope it goes away. Uh, in the Lautenberg Act, it was one of the 10 chemicals that was included in the Lautenberg Act, the thousands of chemicals that would be evaluated for Tosca in conclusion. So I think that we understand that, and that's what we're trying to today is to get everybody together because quite frankly look i only came to this i guess it's four and a half years ago epa has come in and is trying to bring everybody together we're trying to get all the stakeholders in the same room ask the, answer the questions that there are lots of different people getting different answers to we won't come to conclusion today but it is my hope i'm going to go to chris in a second that we will get all the stakeholders together to figure out how do we move together forward. And I think the governor and the attorney general are looking for that as well. I have a question concerning remedy, but Laura was on, on cue first, so. Oh. Laura, and will you do me a favor while you're gonna say something? But the other issue that came up was with the permit renewal, different people are having, you know, think we shouldn't renew the permit, but Laura cautioned me that there were some issues on that, so I don't mean to put you on the spot, but if you um, could talk about well, that too. Well, one thing about the permit is right now, it allows Gelman to discharge their treated wastewater. And so if we try to block the permit or not allow them to, to discharge, we're stopping the treatment, the pump and treat that they're already doing. 
And so there's some way we have to figure out if we're asking for more pump and treat or we want them to be treating the accident, we have to allow for them to discharge either to Honey Creek or to the storm drain system or, or somewhere. So we just have to be careful of blocking that permit. Um, my question had more to go with. Um, I want you know, everybody I think, to have everything now. Yes, I understand. I'm um, trying to educate everybody. You know, I, I think we're all interested and we're all frustrated with the timing this has taken and the cost. And one of the things that I would love to hear from the EPA is, um, you know, it takes some time also for you to assess, you know, not only the national priorities list, but for you to assess what kind of remedy you would take. And then I assume it takes some time for you to get the funds to do the cleanup. Can you give us a sense as we're trying to assess what is the most expeditious strategy that we have? how what we could expect in the Superfund siting or the national priority listing of you know just sort of how long is it two years before we get an understanding of would you do a cleanup how much would a cleanup does it take another year or two to get that funding does it take another year to get permitting you know just sort of a sense of my answer to me that's somewhat speculative unfortunately um, there certainly are a number of steps to uh, the Superfund processes uh, the listing process can take a number of years to uh, to go through, you know, even from where we are right now, having done a preliminary assessment. Um, so getting something on the national priorities list can take some time. Um, the evaluation just, process... Is that like six months to 12 months, or is that when you say some time? It can take up to two years okay. um, uh, to go through that part of the process. Um, the remedial investigation, the feasibility study, um, you know, that can take, you know, on average around seven years. Um, to go through that uh, on a, some super fun sites. I've seen it go happen much faster than that. Uh, and I've also seen, have experience with sites where it's gone slower than that. So until um, EPA were to actually ever um, be in that process for this site, we really wouldn't have an idea as to how long exactly it would take. Um, and fundamentally, you know, at this point in time, there's not a letter of concurrence, and so we really haven't looked at, you know, how long it would take on uh, any of these. Process. So EPA can't do anything or answer those questions until the state says, will you do it? So I understand, but you have other super fun sites where you've gone through these processes, right? So you mm -hmm. do have a sense of, as you say, two years or five years, and then, you know, to get funding for a project. You know, uh, I want, I want to actually, so I mean, I've, I've had sites go much faster in the uh, RISS. Um, and I've had sites that go on slow in the RFS. Uh, I really have, and each site's different. Mm -hmm. um, there's a number of different factors. Um, you know, certainly this site has a lot of history and a lot of data associated with it. Um, that differentiates it from other sites. Um, but as far as complexity of the uh, cleanup too, um, in terms of what's happening right now, just even looking at that, you know, it's not a very simple, uh, you know, dig and haul type cleanup we're talking about either. So to get anything beyond, you know, this is the time range, you know, I, I really rather not do that at this point in time because we haven't looked at the site in terms of trying to select the remedy. Um, as far as getting funding though, um, I think that what I, one of the things I've heard out there is that there's a question of whether or not, um, you know, it would be taxpayer dollars paying for it or something like that. You know, EPA certainly seeks to have polluters pay for cleanups. So as far as, you know, in terms of time to go get funds, um, if you have a polluter on the hook, um, yeah, it takes time to reach agreements right. uh, with responsible parties, not necessarily we're seeking funds from uh, necessarily other sources if we believe we have a source at hand. But, you know, again, that's, you yeah. know, uh, you we're know, not there. We have other super fun sites throughout the watershed, and, it, you know, maybe it would be helpful, and I don't know if this is something that Region 5 has, is to give best case scenarios or worst case average time for a cleanup of a site or average time for action. Because I feel like as we're trying to decide different strategies of where to invest, it's hard to understand. So what I'm going to defend is. Michael because I've been okay. in, in the, the super fun. And EPA will not give you answers on that because every site is different. Every per set there. Yeah. I mean, I've really, he's been on the, like now they're making me be chaperone. <laughs> <laughs> because, and, and my chaperones, <laughs> his chaperones too. I but shouldn't it, say that. It's there. unlikely to be worse than what we're doing with them. Well, they can't start the process unless they're asked to come in. So we're at a point 
that if ultimately, this, I am going to say this week, I'm trying to stay on the same page as all stakeholders, but I know after all the conversations, EPA cannot do another thing or take another step unless they're invited in. So not, no time, no clock can start. And we, some people would say two years were lost in, so I'm not going to, I guess I am sort of influencing it by saying that, but I think people need to, you know, if you can. And inviting them in does not um, bar us from continuing what we're doing under state law. Chris? So following up on the, on, on the remedy question, and I think I'm, your answer will probably be best to speculate, but I want to, but one of the, uh, one of the, uh, the, the potential poor case scenarios, as it's been described to me, potential from, mm -hmm. uh, from super fun engagement, uh, is that uh, assuming that there's aquifer cleanup, then there's going to be, uh, there's going to be treatment and discharge. The discharge is going to be to a level that I'm, uh, I'm assuming is a drinking water standard. In this case, I, it's going to, I'm, I'm going to take 7.2, and the drink and the discharge is going to go somewhere. Um, one concern that's been, and this kind of gets to what Councilmember Griswold was saying about public confidence and public safety and, and public, uh, you know, the, the interactions and disconnects between those two. Is there a scenario where the like right now the discharge is in Honey Creek? Is there a scenario? Where there's dis there's a treatment at Honey Creek accelerated, uh, and it's done to drinking water standard, and one for the act saying you know uh, discharge at a level below the drinking water standard but above where it is presently is discharged into Barton Pond. Gelman used to treat to not detect. The eagle are answering. Uh, yeah, you know, we, we haven't, that's a speculative at this point, sure. but the, uh, you know, EPA can't select remedies that are not protective. So, but, but so if, if, if the discharge, if the discharge creates a situation that's not protective, we can't. Understood, but if you have not protected, it would be driven by 7.2, whereas I, what Councilman Griswold was saying, and I think it's, it's reasonable, is that there's uh, public concern about 7.1, whereas uh, scientifically, 7.1 is within reasonable threshold. 7.1 from a public perception perspective would be suboptimal. I, I think that the question of whether or not what the um, applicable criteria is within the plume, and it may be a different question than what is the applicable criteria for discharge. Right. Um, yeah. And that's something that's, you know, that gets into an area where now that's a more complex uh, evaluation that EPA has not done. And you know that's really something to be done as a part of a remedy selection process. Okay. And so it's, um, so it's, it's speculative at this point in time because we have not taken a look at what would be the impact of, you know, what would, of different discharges, you know, um, in terms of what could be the long-term uh, impact of different discharge uh, concentrations. So it is that's not driven by the standard. Uh, it's it's not black letter goes to standard call of the day. It's a more nuanced conversation. I think it's a more nuanced conversation. It's perhaps how expected. It may end up being at that number, but it may not be. I mean, that's something that we're, we're not. EPA is not the, the the in a process right now where we're looking at that question. Thank you. Okay, we're going to Chairman Morgan and then Rep. Robbie and then Jane. Thanks. Thank you, Congresswoman. I think the so and the, from the county perspective, we are a party to the lawsuit. Um, but it, I think the one clear thing that we know is that I think all of us are really rather sick and tired of it not being cleaned up and, and have a sense uh, that there hasn't been enough action on this. I think the DEQ has been um, a, a, a helpful partner in all of this, but uh, I think there's a sense that there is not an, an immediacy uh, or the sense of urgency that our residents and our community expect on this. Uh, I think the overall question for us is sort of what can we do to get the most immediate action? Um, obviously, that's not a simple question, um, but we've heard a lot of uncertainty around every option. So given all the things that are at our disposal, is there any recommendation that the EPA or the EQ can give us to, in terms of action that we can take as units of government to be on the same page to seek the most immediate action? You know, as a project manager in EPA, I never 
try and tell the public what to think or what to feel, and I'd rather not um, you know, answer that question in terms of you know, whatever actions, of course of action, you know, the public uh, you know, seeks to take out here. I think it's really up to them, and right? it's something that um, it depends on what their motivation and goals are, and I'd really rather not you know, go into advising the uh, public on what uh, they should be doing next. I guess is there, maybe the better question is, uh, looking at the DEQ timing and, and process, it, it does sound like it's mostly containment. Um, can we get any more insight as to what the next steps for the DEQ process will look like in terms of timing, and if there's any cleanup potential, or if it's just containment? I think that's the big question we're all trying to answer is, if we go with the EPA, sounds like we might get some better cleanup, over some period of time that's somewhat ambiguous because we don't have the, the governor's directive on that. But the EPA, or the, the DEQ has been our only option at this point. I think there's just a sense that we haven't had quick enough action. And I don't mean offense by that, I mean it's just where the, the community's feeling at this point. Can, can I jump in and answer yeah. this for you? I'm going to let through that. So my name is Sue Lee Meeting. I'm the division chief for the Remediation Rebuilding um, Division in Eagle. <coughs> So, and I'm pleased to be here. Thank you very much. So, in terms of immediate action and what is the state doing next, we are working with the court and the interveners. And I can't say a whole lot more than that, um, any more than Mitch said to begin with. So, as, as you are an intervener as well, you're privy to the conversations that are happening and what's going on. Um, I would like to say that in terms of immediate action, I work on a number of other Superfund sites pretty intimately familiar with a number of them because Superfund uh, is in my division. And we have uh, 85 active sites, I believe. Uh, 19 have been listed in the state so far. I don't know how many of those have the aquifer restoration. Um, I don't think any have achieved that yet. Um, but that's an interesting question. I also think, in, again, in terms of immediate action, and I understand that, believe me, I understand that. We feel that pressure every day, and, and we want it as much or more than the community does. I know it doesn't appear that way, but we are, again, working with the courts. We are constrained by what our laws say we, we can do. So that's a very important point. You're, the, law the law at the state level is not as strong as the federal law. Well, I would, I would say it differently. Go ahead. I should pass my legislation. the track record and the experience of EPA Superfund sites. And I also think in terms of, again, back to immediate action, it's important to, uh, again, Laura's questions are very much on point. What is the potential timeline? So, you know, there's the preliminary assessment, there's a remedial, or I'm sorry, a site investigation first. You have to follow the circle process, right? <coughs> site investigation, a couple of years, but you're not working at cross, here's what I'm trying to understand. You're not working at cross purposes. For a year, since I've started working on this, everybody's saying EPA coming in would make this worse, it would. I, I think I that it would make it confusing. Um, and I would, we have had, had, we have had many conversations with EPA in the last um, several months, years actually. Um, we do not see the advantage at this point of going to an MPL listing, again, based on timing and based on the capabilities under under the state law versus federal law. Could you respond to that? Um, well, first of all, I want to interject one, one comment of uh, the characterization of the state as not, of, of lacking urgency. Um, that's something I, I, would, I would disagree with um, because uh, one thing that came, so during the preliminary assessment, there was uh, a, a, an extensive, we did an extensive review of the site file, um, which is chock full of uh, examples of, of records showing the urgency and the kind of fire and the drive that the state sh has shown over the years um, in terms of, you know, attempting uh, their best and continue to work hard on the site. And it's something, you know, since I've been uh, involved is to see the, um, the level of effort uh, displayed by the state is high. Um, I appreciate the fact that you know um, many stakeholders may have um, you know whatever feelings they have about the state. I just want to share what, uh, the impression that I have gotten. 
since being on the site um, is that you know for many years the state has tried very hard to um, implement the uh, the best remedy they can and uh, have made, made a high level effort throughout their work on the site. Um, sorry, the, the question that I'm being asked to would it be if your if the EPA come in would it be complicated? I, I think they wouldn't be entirely complicated. I, I think that we would you know. Because EPA always commits to work with our state counterparts, that I think that we would be working in concert. Um, were it to ever be a state lead, a federal lead site? Well, there's a lot of super fun sites in Michigan. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I'm trying to keep the editorial and get the fit. So, Rep, I so, love you, but I'm just I'm keeping this as a compost meeting. <laughs> okay, Rep so, you <laughs> so we've established so far EPA has high cleanup standard. EPA process would not necessarily complicate the court proceedings that are happening now. Just a series of timeline questions for you. So the governor sends you a letter. You start what? Uh, then would, uh, we'd have to evaluate whether or not we're going to be uh, then deciding to move it forward. So you know, just because there's a letter from the governor, it does not guarantee. So say you make that decision and you say, "Yep, we're going to proceed with this." Then you create that assessment. Is that the first step? Then we move forward in the uh, national priorities list. And as far as anything beyond that, I'd rather not say because it's uh, speculative in terms of. How we then proceed? So, but that's that step is first. You have to list the you have to list this site on the national priorities list. That takes for. And you know, I, I'd, I'd rather just say you know. I'm just trying to figure out when you do the assessment. They have to go through an analysis. Before. Yeah, when does the analysis happen? That's what I'm trying to figure out. The analysis for the remedy selection. Right. That's a separate process. Yeah. That's the remedial investigation. The, the process no. to get listed on the national. The process get listed. You you know there it's in um, proposed. Um, there's a common period, you know, that process for the listing process can take, uh, you know, a couple of years. It's not that we're doing any more necessarily data collection, data evaluation. Um, it's more of an administrative process to, you know, move it forward. Where well, you're doing community engagement, right? You're going yes. out to the community asking people, hey, is this... So, what I'm trying to get at is starting this process is not locking us into a final listing, right, from the EPA. Starting this process is starting community dialogue, starting the EPA, coming to the table and evaluating this project, which you can't do now, right, because we haven't engaged you yet. So getting, getting some recommendation from the locals and from the governor saying, yes, we want to go down this road, that just gets you in the room. Now you're here out of the goodness of your heart, and thank you for being here, but it gets you in the room and it gets you engaging the public. It doesn't necessarily say we're automatically going to be listed. Is that right? Michael? I, I don't... I, Michael? I don't know if I can really answer that yeah. question, but hold on, hold on a second. Yeah. You know, I, I don't expect that we'd be starting that process if it wasn't the expectation that we would be completing that process. And they have done the preliminary, so one of the things that people have said, should we go to ask for the Superfund site? The prelim, because some of the parties did request Superfund site, the preliminary assessment mm -hmm. has been done. So having any more communities to ask for a Superfund site or joining, yeah. it's, not, it's not productive use of time. I've got, Jane's been sitting there with her hand up. And this question has been asked in various forms. So if EPA or Superfund takes over, what happens to uh, the court cases? Negotiations are in process. Do the court, can the court cases continue? Or are they put on hold? You know, I, I don't think I can answer that question at this point in time, because really, you know, we're at a, we haven't done those kinds of evaluation. We haven't necessarily looked at, you know, exactly how it would play out in terms of, uh, you know, because we don't have a, a letter of concurrence from the governor. Um, so as far as, you know, doing some, doing something like that, uh, or be able to answer that question of, you know, how would it exactly play out, you know, we can't do that at this point in time. I think there's a follow-up question over here as well. One of my questions is, if the EPA evaluates the situation, would the current containment and cleanup actions have to stop? Would they be required to stop? while EPA was evaluating, or could they continue until EPA evaluates the situation? Um, again, that, that, I, I think that we wouldn't want any, uh, you know, current cleanup, ongoing cleanup to stop where EPA would be uh, more involved. You know, we certainly want, don't want to create situations that are less protective of the human health environment. Thank you. Okay. May I? Dan, um, short. Yeah, very short. Um, 
my understanding, Michael, is that we've finished the preliminary assessment, the site inspection, and right now we're at the last box where we need a letter of concurrence from the governor. And after that follows, then there's a drafting of a hazardous ranking score package which is submitted into the Federal Register for 60-day public comments. Yeah. And after that 60-day public comment period, then EPA makes a determination on whether or not this site is actually listed as an NPL site. Is that correct? Yeah, but that, that time period in terms of, so I want to attach the time period to that, but yeah. This I wasn't asking for a time period, but that's really helpful to know. Like, I want to know like, what the steps are. Okay. And so Dan, is that what, so. Yeah, exactly it is. But yeah, that, those steps can take, it's not just 60 days, it's just simply, you know, which federal register, you know, you know time periods between you know, those are being published and things like that. But okay, there's a question behind Mitch. And then I think that because it's getting close to 1015, I'm going to ask some of the uh, public the electeds here if they want to make comments and do, and then we'll figure out how we take this next steps. So just to sort of. But Thank you. I appreciate everyone uh, coming here. It's an enlightening conversation. Council member for the fifth ward of Ann Arbor. Um, and, and I want to just put a precursor out there. This is not putting property values ahead of public health. Public health comes as our first job. Uh, but what are the ramifications for property owners and, and people who have vested interest in the area that is listed as a Superfund site? Uh, what are there deed restrictions or notifications? And what, what happens uh, in the case that uh, for these people who own property in this area that is, is designated as a Superfund site, what, what are the ramifications for those folks? You know, EPA doesn't look at property values during the uh, Superfund process. You know, the, the number of factors that go into um, property values are numerous. And it could be all kinds of things. It could be how the local economy is doing. It could be you know whether what the tax levels are. Absolutely. There's, there's so many different, uh, but there's so many different issues that you know we don't. And, and the, the most important issue is what people perceive. You know how, what they perceive their property value to be. So, but you know, didn't you comment you've seen communities? Because I asked that question last yeah. week, and you told me that communities had managed it. It's how community manages it as well. Um. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's in terms of how they manage their perception, or I feel like, you know, in terms of whether or not, some people may look at whether or not the Superfund site and say, well, this means that, you know, Superfund is obligated to clean this thing up right. um, at some point in time. Some people may look at it and say, this is terrible, it's a Superfund site. It may not want it to be a Superfund site. I'm not about to tell him what they should or should not think in that situation. Sure. Um, Michael, could you address the question specifically about deed restrictions? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Building, yeah. If you're buying, selling, building, what are the additional restrictions or ramifications? Is there anything other than the perception? I understand all the other variables that go into the price of, of real estate, but the legality of, of being a super fund. You state. know, there's already deed restrictions, right? You do know that there's already deed restrictions. But I think his question was around whether around super fund. Yeah, well, we, often, we often rely upon local deed restrictions um, as any, some of our institutional controls. You know, so for saying that you can't, you know, put a well of your, you know, property or put a well in such and such property, you know, we often rely upon um, the the processes or the uh, kind of the deed restrictions are already in place. Michael, it's my understanding though, if this became a national priorities list, it would be the boundaries of the former Gelman plant that would be the designated quote Superfund site property itself, not. You're not the whole city of Ann Arbor is going to be designated uh, property-wise as a Superfund site. I'm going to answer that in a more kind of, uh, respond to that in a more kind of general Thank you. Um, way, and that typically what we look at is the, the site is the facility and then any kind of contamination emanating from that facility. So the groundwater plume at a, uh, that extends from the facility may be considered part of the site. The properties above it are not necessarily considered to be Superfund. You know, those parcels are not considered to be necessarily a part of the Superfund site. Thank you. And unless you have a situation where it's daylighting, understand it's something like that. But you know, um, understand. Thank as far you. as how we look here, it's you know we're, we're not there to you know kind of designate this thing. That Thank you, sir. Time. Okay, uh, um, I'm going to get the one because we haven't you haven't asked. But then I'd like to invite the mayors and the supervisors and the electeds for any comments. Thanks. Uh, can someone? answer this question. 
I understand we're pumping and treating at 500 gallons a minute. The consent judgment, my understanding was that the amount that was to be allowed was up to how many? 1,300. How many? 1,300. 1,300, almost three times what is now being pumped and treated. Why are we not pumping and treating up to the maximum allowed? Uh, because the uh, there's a the third uh, amendment to the consent judgment basically allowed them to uh, pump what is needed to meet the objectives of that consent judgment. And the objectives of the consent judgment, as it stands now, is uh, there's a eastern area in the pro uh, east of Wagner Road and a western area west of Wagner Road. The, can, the uh, objectives in the east area is to keep the uh, groundwater contamination within the prohibition zone uh, that is identified as part of that consent judgment. So it doesn't go outside the prohibition zone at, at the current consent judgment that's greater than 85 ppb. And then the western area is a non-expansion objective, basically that there are uh, compliance monitoring wells that there, there's enough pumping, there's, uh, they, they do enough pumping uh, to make sure that uh, the compliance monitoring wells where, where they monitor do not rise above 85 parts per billion in the current consent judgment. So that is why they are at 500 gallons a minute, it's a little less than that. That is why uh, they are meeting those objectives and that is allowed under the, cur the current consent judgment. So I'm going to actually ask our elected, because we're getting down in time, if Jeff, Yusuf, Mr. Mayor, Jack, any of our electeds would like to make comments, how we go next steps, questions that you still have in your minds. I know we've got a lot of city council. I'll start. I'll start. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, we have 30 plus years of, uh, of history here. What I see, it, it's, this is an incredibly uh, involved complex issue it's been uh, tied up in the, in the in the in the court system they've had a lot of influence on, on the, the direction it's gone a lot of people here have been involved in it for a long time all due respect to uh, to to what they've done or tried to do to improve this whole situation you know we said Silas said it three years ago when we requested this, this, this become a super fun site I, I agree with Kathy I could, that a full court press is needed. Whatever options are open, I don't know why we we don't go after any option that, that's out there. We tried to do it before. Who needs to make the request to the governor to get the letter written? Mr. I think local. I, there are there is more than one. I've been trying to represent yeah. all of you, yeah. as you know. So I, I will, honestly, when the governor asked me, I did. I said, I want to get everybody together and make. So you all need to decide that. And I suspect that a smaller group needs the mayors, the supervisors, the elected should. There's been different people on different yeah. pages. And I'd like to get everybody on the same. My goal today, because when I'm talking to everybody, I hear the same things and the same questions, and we all get different answers was to get all the stakeholders in here, have Eagle and EPA here answer questions and see if there is more. And I think the people will tell you, I've been having a lot of conversations this month to try to get everybody. Yeah. It would be great if the impacted municipalities came to agreement and wrote a letter requesting it. Um, Ann Arbor Township um, is one of the petitioners to get the EPA involved and I think that uh, just the short answer is that we have um, received um, uh, benefit from EPA's very minimal involvement to date. I would very much look forward to them having a much more significant involvement because I think as, to the extent their hands have been tied by the relationship at this point in time, we have uh, had significantly more attention to community concerns. Uh, second of all, I would just like to say that, uh, so I've been involved in this for about 15 years. The plume continues to spread um, with um, little effective enforcement by um, Eagle now. Um, the, despite all of Gelman's predictions, uh, one four dioxane is approaching the, the water source for the city of Ann Arbor. 
which Ann Arbor Township also um, makes benefit of by purchase of agreements. And despite that, the fact that Gelman's predictions have been uniformly wrong in almost every case, there is no contingency plan being developed for what happens if and when Barton Ponds gets contaminated. That is what I've been trying to get something done for 15 years with Eagle to absolutely no avail. I think we could do much better with the EPA. Thank you, Mayor Jason. Uh, just briefly, I do want to add thanks to the EPA, especially for your involvement. I think to Mike's comments, it has been clearly helpful uh, at this point uh, to have the EPA involved, uh, especially in the conversation, but also to the DEQ, I think we need to get some sort of action if we're all working together. Uh, so I thank you all for being part of that and for really caring about our community. Uh, my comments are on sense of urgency is that I think all of us are hearing an incredible sense of urgency and fear from our residents about whether they are safe in their homes and drinking their water. Uh, so our, our, our frustration is, is that of our residents and it's not meant to be, uh, you know, harsh towards anyone in particular, but just a, an expression of, of the concern that our residents are facing. I also want to urge all of us um, as elected leaders, I think as Debbie said, um, to be unified in our efforts. Um, at the county, the conversation with uh, those of us as county commissioners has been that we want to be a close partner with our with the townships, the city of Ann Arbor, and with our residents to, to really push for whatever we think collectively is the best, uh, most useful course of action. Um, it sounds like there's no clear answer to hardly anything up here um, at this point, but it sounds like there are some directions we can go in. Um, I also just want to add thank you to Congresswoman Dingle. Um, I think all of us have had a lot of conversations with Congresswoman Dingle in the last month or two here and, and long before that. Uh, and so her leadership in pushing and pulling uh, all of us and, and the great folks in the EPA and the DEQ is the only reason that we're having any traction on this at all. So just incredible appreciation for you, Debbie, for your leadership on that. And uh, I guess interest in working collaborative, collaboratively with all of us going forward. So thank you. Thank you, Jason. Mr. Mayor? Well, next time I'm going to have to go in front of Jason. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, because I want to echo, uh, you know, basically down the line what he said. Uh, thank you very much for, for the work that the EPA has done to date on the site for being here today and for the work that you've done. Uh, you know, uh, Representative Dingle, you know, I wish too to echo uh, what, uh, what uh, Commissioner Morgan was saying with respect to uh, your your goal in being uh, for a, a, a uh, to changing the inertia on this in a way that is broad based uh, and thoughtful, and that's I think uh, where, uh, where where we're, we're trying to get to on this. Uh, you know, I think we have a. Uh, uh, we have a charge, and it's it's uh, on, on parallel tracks. Uh, we have a charge to make sure that the water that we provide uh, is uh, is safe, that people are safe in their homes, that they're safe in their parks, uh, and you know, the, from the city that is focused on uh, you know, the, uh, on the preservation. Well, uh, th those are those are goals, but, and uh, as we hear, uh, you know, at least with respect to the city, that there is a current state of safety. And it's important, I think, that we communicate that, uh, that when residents say, should we be drinking bottled water? Uh, you know, the answer is that the water that you're receiving from Ann Arbor uh, is safe. Uh, that does not mean that it, will, that it will ever be thus, and we need to make sure that we keep it that way. Uh, and uh, that's what this, that's what the, you know, the conversation has been going on for, for years have been focused on, and I appreciate that we're having a heightened focus on that conversation now and being thoughtful about planning going forward. So, uh, thank you to everybody for being here. Um, I've been pretty consistent in my position on this. Uh, I was a county commissioner for six years, and in 2014 or 2015, I believe, I worked on and introduced a resolution to uh, engage the EPA, uh, to support the engagement of the EPA. Um, I think uh, that we should have the EPA at the table. Um, to the people at Eagle and DQ, I know that you are hardworking individuals um, who have tried really hard, um, but 30 plus, almost 40 years is an unacceptable amount of time to have had this pollution in our ground. Um, 
and whatever we've been doing for the last 40 years has not worked. Um, and I don't see the harm in bringing EPA to the table. I think EPA has different tools that it can engage. Um, and, you know, honestly, like, I, I don't see the harm in, in bringing them to the table and bringing their expertise and at least giving them the opportunity to look at and explore whether this is something that, you know, meets their criteria to be on their priorities list. Um, so I'm, I'm not convinced that uh, in the arguments for why we shouldn't involve the EPA. Um, I was told by Bob Wagner five years ago that in 30 years, the plume water would be in Barton Pond. That's what he told me at a county commission meeting. I can go back and watch the tape. And when he said that, he said it very nonchalantly. He was like, oh, you know, it's going to be 30 years. Don't worry about it. And I, at the time, I was 25. And I was like, so I'm going to be 55 years old, still living in Ann Arbor, because I am leaving this community. And then suddenly, my drinking water is going to have dioxane in it. So that, that's not nonchalant to me. And I know, you know, again, Bob's a good guy. Um, I don't think he meant it that way. But the reality is, is that's what he said. And, and again, that was five years ago. So now we're only 25 years away from that water being in our drinking water supply. So we need to take some aggressive action and uh, just relying on the old um, systems that we have in the past. It hasn't worked before. Fool me once, right? Fool me twice, fool me three times. I mean, it's just, it had, nothing's happened. So let's try something new and hopefully that will work. Even if it takes two years to do the study, even if it takes seven years, it's been 40 years that we've been waiting longer than I've been alive. Yeah. So. Uh, Roger, hang on. I want to. I'm trying to get the party. So, Laura, your party to the at least for a little while longer. I can't believe Laura is leaving us, but she'll be in another good job. But do you have any comments? You know, I, I'm a little unique in that I'm not representing the citizens. I'm but you are party. Them. Yes, and I am party. Um, you know, I think for me, um, it, it has been a very frustrating experience, and I think we're trying to cast about to look at something that will speed it up um, and, and trying to weigh the costs here. Um, you know, I, I actually feel that there has been some progress made in the past. I think it's been slower than we wanted, and I don't think we're anywhere near where we want to get. Um, you know, I, I, I appreciate you bringing all the parties together because I think the Watershed Council has been unclear. We've thrown our hat traditionally in to the negotiations. Um, but again, I don't see any problem in terms of pursuing all strategies to get a better outcome. Is Sierra Club in the room? Yeah. Not exactly officially, but <laughs> well, this is sure. anybody want to comment because you're an intervener as well? Well, unless uh, Nancy, you can say something otherwise, but we certainly went along with the uh, uh, with, with request uh, for the preliminary assessment um, in uh, 2016. And uh, I just don't have anything further to add uh, other than what Joseph said. Um, I think we need the, uh, the, the federal government's interaction on this one. I, I think it's time, as you were saying, you know, we've been at this for 40 years, and we don't have a solution. So arguing over whether EPA's involvement will take five years or 10 years, that's still less time than we've already spent on it. And, um, I think it's really see, important. I'm going to let speak, just, but just I just, second. No, I, I need to get this in before. It, 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 it. The time scale on this, everybody needs to realize, is a game changer. Dioxin is one of the forever chemicals like PFAS. When this happened, people didn't understand the time scale. And I think there's a lot of laws and a lot of actions that are still not appreciative of the time scale we're talking about here. You're worried about it being cleaned up. It's probably your great grandchildren are still going to be dealing with this. So what entity is going to be around in two or three hundred years to clean the rest of this up and the PFAS that are happening the same way? This is what we have to start thinking about. And we all have to work together in this. It can't be relying on the EPA by itself. All the local units have to do their due diligence for as long as it takes to match the scale of the problem. So I'm going to thank everybody for coming. We need to have another meeting. We need to get the stakeholders together. 
I know Michael won't be part of it, but I, if I have one message, we all need to get on the same page because the lack of unity in the lack, I, you know, I came in this as a new member for it years ago. I'm not so new anymore. I've spent a lot of time with everybody, and people need the unity is going to get us to where we need to go. So I'm trying to not speak. When the governor asked me what I thought, I said I want to represent the stakeholders. And so I have not given an opinion because I think it's important to represent everybody at this table. But I do think that it is critical that we all be on the same page and move together going forward. And with that, I will adjourn this meeting until we schedule.